Welcome to Mick and T Sports Report here on CHCO TV. I'm Joe Tykotsky and I'm here in New Haven, Connecticut. I'm Evan McFarland and I'm once again sitting in my extremely hot office at the Algonquin Golf Course in St. Andrews, New Brunswick. Never been in better shape, by the way. Nice. Good to hear. This is episode number nine for us as we cruise along. Um, or if you're from New York or New Jersey, it would be episode nine. Um, <laughs> It's also our fifth episode using Zoom and our, the final episode of our first season. Who'd have thunk? Man, That's oh, man. That went so fast. It did. It did. Wow. Um, so the U.S.-Canada border is, uh, as you know, it's still closed for yet another month. And uh, have you know what this is starting to remind me of with these continued border closings? Yep. <laughs> uh, Lucy and Charlie Brown, the football yep. is always getting taken away. It's just, it's not fair to us, but we'll but, deal with uh, it. The reality of the situation is for a while, the football is not even going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> good point. How's everything going up in New Brunswick? Uh, it's, it's going pretty good. Uh, tourist season's doing fairly well in uh, my neck of the woods, I guess. Uh, Bubble-wise throughout uh, Atlanta, Canada, I think we're we're really missing the the Quebec and Ontario borders being shut for sure. But uh, things seem to be rolling along pretty good. Um, a few active cases in each province right now, but it's staying fairly fairly contained. Nothing serious as of yet. So fingers crossed. Always good to hear. Um, as we mentioned on our last show, since CHCO is available on Bell Satellite TV all throughout Canada. You can watch our shows on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. If you live in Chilliwack, British Columbia, <laughs> Milk River, Alberta, population 827, and in Booktouche. Did I pronounce that correctly? You know, that's not bad. <laughs> right here in New Brunswick. Uh, actually, a college friend of mine, Tom Sayers, um, his uh, mom was born there and lived to over 100 years old. Wow. Good, good and, uh, water. Yeah. And as always, our U.S. viewers and others can watch the show on Charlotte County Television's YouTube channel, which we hope you subscribe to. Uh, that brings us to a new feature on our show called Small Town Spotlight, where we do a deep dive into one of the three towns that we mentioned on our previous show. So for the debut of this feature, we're going to look at Flynn Flon, Manitoba, nice. located a mere seven hours north of Winnipeg. To tell us a bit about Flynn Flon, I interviewed Eric Westhaver. He's a senior reporter for the weekly newspaper, The Flynn Flon Reminder. So let's take a look at that interview now. For our first edition of Small Town Spotlight, we're going to feature the town of Flynn Flon, Manitoba. Located a mere 3,682 kilometers, or 2,304 miles, from the studios of CHCO. But rather than take a 39-hour car ride, we've hunted down Eric Westhaver, who is the senior reporter of the weekly newspaper in town called the Flynn Flon Reminder, to tell us a little bit about the town. Eric, how's everything going today? Everything is just dandy. How's everything in your neck of the woods? Good, good. Before we chat with Eric, quick background for our viewers. The town has a population of a little over 5,000. The high school is called Hapnot Collegiate with 250 students, and they're called the Copper Kings and the Copper Queens. Yes. Uh, the average daily temperature in January is two degrees below zero Fahrenheit, minus 19 Celsius. But on the bright side, in January, they only average seven inches of snow. Um, at this point, my head's spinning a little bit. So, Eric, why don't you answer the most obvious question we all have? How the heck did the town get its name? <laughs> well, you've done your research on the, uh, on the climate and everything, so kudos to you for that. Um, being born and raised in Flin Flon, when you say you're from here, it's the first question every single time without fail. Um, the short version of the story is, is that Flin Flon is named after a character from an old novel called The Sunless City. Um, if you want to picture what it's like, picture... Um, a, a kind of a bad knockoff of a Jules Verne novel or something like that. Um, the main character of the book is called Josiah Flint of Addy Flonaton. And that book happened to make its way into the possession of a prospector named Tom Creighton. 
um, who, along with a, a, a guide named David Collins, discovered the ore deposit that the whole town was built on. So basically, okay. Okay. copper and zinc and everything was found here. Um, a mining camp was built, a tent city, a small town, and then eventually what we've got here in Flint Flon today. That is awesome. All right, let's go sports-wise. A few sports-related tidbits about the town. The new coach of the NHL's Minnesota Wild is Dean Evason, who was born in Flin Flon and played for a while for our Hartford Whalers. I'm from about 45 minutes from there. Mm -hmm. um, it's also the birthplace of Bobby Clark, Hall of Famer, who won two Stanley Cups with the Flyers. And it has a team in the Saskatchewan Junior Hockey League called the Bombers. Mm -hmm. um, but which professional teams do the local residents typically root for? Well, it varies from sport to sport, and it's pretty much a grab bag for, like, your MLB teams or your NFL teams. Like, people just have their own reasons for it. There's not really any sort of arc um, covering everybody, but it's, it's a little different for the NHL because there's such a link between Flin Flon and the Philadelphia Flyers, not just because of, of Bobby Clark, um, but also because of Reggie Leach. Um, oh, okay. The players who played in Flin Flon for the Bombers um, are still pretty beloved figures here. Their numbers are retired at the Whitney Forum, the rink the Bombers play in. Um, there's, there are a lot of links, and there are a few other um, people with Flin Flon links, ex-Bombers, who played there as well. Um, I imagine you mentioned the Hartford Whalers. At one point, I think the Whalers had four different Flin Flon Bombers playing for them at the same time. That's crazy. Um, yeah. Blaine Stoughton being one of them. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I assume if they were still around, there might still be a couple of Whaler fans kicking around, but you know, the, the Flyers have a big contingent. The Jets have a big contingent in the NHL. Everything else is just kind of a, a dog's breakfast. Um, and yeah, it goes for most of the major sports. People will just pick what they cheer for individually. And, and that's generally it. That is, that's some good stuff. Well, Eric, we, uh, we could have gone for 30 minutes or gone an hour and maybe down the road when we start getting a little more in depth in our small town spotlight, we can get back to you. Um, but thanks so much for coming on the show um, and letting our viewers know a little bit about Flynn Flynn. If you'd like to check out his paper, The Reminder, it's online at thereminder.ca. Uh, Eric, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed our inaugural um, edition of Small Town Spotlight. We'll be back to interview Canadian Olympic marathoner Dana Pitoreski from Vancouver. Uh, you're watching Mick and T Sports Report on CHCO. Welcome back to Mick and T Sports Report on CHCO TV, and we hope you enjoyed Small Town Spotlight. And if Manitoba wasn't far enough away from St. Andrews, we'll now be going 21 hours further west with our special guest for this episode, Dana Pitoreski. She's originally from Tecumseh, Ontario. I hope I pronounced that right. About 30 minutes from Detroit and currently lives in Vancouver. She graduated from the University of Windsor with degrees in honors biology and psychology. And back on October 20th of last year, she ran a two hour, 29 minute, three second marathon in Toronto, beating her personal best by over seven minutes. And in the process, yeah. secured a berth with Team Canada to the Summer Olympics in Tokyo. Dana, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Great. Um, to back up a bit, on March 22nd, the Canadian Olympic Committee announced they would not be sending their athletes to Tokyo because of the risks associated with the coronavirus outbreak. And then two days later, uh, the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, postponed the games until the summer of 2021. Um, but before we talk about that, Dana, why don't you take us through that that day in October when you qualified for the Olympics and going in if you thought you had a good shot to qualify that day? Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess I, I approached that day um, definitely feeling confident. I think if you, if you don't feel confident, you're not even going to give yourself the opportunity 
um, to go after that goal. Um, so I had a lot of confidence. My training block had been a lot rockier than any other one that I'd done, but the, the last, um, maybe five weeks or four weeks heading into the race. Um, I'd had the best sessions ever. So that left me with a lot of um, confidence with my fitness at the time. Um, and to be honest, like standing on that starting line, I was just so happy to even get there because at one point during the build, I didn't think I would be on the start line at all. It just, nothing was going well. Um, so I just stood there feeling um, a lot of gratitude for just being in that spot. I think that helped take a lot of pressure off of myself um, because I just wanted to show off all the hard work that we'd put forth. And um, yeah, it went really well. Uh, of course, <laughs> I PB'd by over seven minutes and the whole time, um, minus like the, the last maybe seven kilometers I felt really 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 good and the whole way I just knew it was going to be a special day and I just kept telling myself to um like this is your moment this is what you've been working hard for and you know don't be scared that maybe this isn't as this I haven't run that fast um sort of like don't put barriers on yourself um don't get too nervous that this is faster than you've ever run through the first half of a marathon. Like just believe that this is a special day and just go with it. Well, Ev, you got a question for Dana? Yeah, I, Dana, I'm kind of seeing this in the golf world, the industry that I work in, but uh, it's a sport where you're able to social distance and with uh, all these team sports being shut down, uh, do you, I mean, I see it, but do you, do you agree this is a great opportunity for running as a sport to see an increase in maybe professional athletes? I think I, I've sort of heard both sides where I'm used to running like a marathon and usually that's a mass amount of participants. So in a way like that could be hit hard. Um, but I think there are certainly ways for elite marathons to maybe still have a chance or some some workaround perhaps that could allow those races to still occur. Okay. You see an increase in the amount of people running in general? Looks to be that way. I think it's, um for me, it's definitely a way that I cope with stress and just have that time of, time with my thoughts, time to just disconnect from uh, social media, from news. Um, so I think a lot of people have really grabbed onto that as well. And just being outside, I think is so therapeutic. It really doesn't matter how fast you're running. <laughs> just being yeah. out in nature can be so healing. Now, how do you go about actually mapping out a one year delay in the Olympics, which I'm sure you didn't think uh, in October was going to happen. How, who helps you with that? Well, my husband is my coach and, um, you know, as long as you have a good amount of time before any race, you can start a good build for that. So for me, I guess the biggest change was I would have been prepping for the Olympics for August. Um, but instead, we just treated like this like any other summer where I'm doing more base training. And then we'll probably do some specific work in the fall just to get a good chunk of harder work in um, whether I mean, there won't be a race really, but just to keep the body working hard <laughs> right right and there are three two other people that have qualified for the olympics i read a male marathon runner and a race walker i believe yep yeah, yep yeah. the other um trevor hoffbauer won the canadian olympic trials as well and he ran under the olympic standard so that secured his spot and then a race walker um evan dunphy um is also pre-qualified I think you should leave it just like that. Just the three of you go. You get more space for yourselves over there. Yeah. <laughs> more notoriety. Uh, um, nope. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. amazing story. Um, well, for our charity spotlight, we've been asking our guests to have us highlight a charity they're choosing. Dana has chosen Project ALS, which is the world's leading ALS research organization. 
They're committed to finding a cure for ALS, which is also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. And uh, if you'd like to donate to that, which we hope people will, you can go to projectals.org. Um, and before she leaves, I also wanted to mention that Dana is a global ambassador for a worldwide athletic retailer, Lulu Lemon. Oh, um, nice. <laughs> Evan always runs They're around. They're the best. Evan runs around town with his Lulu Lemon uh, yoga pants on, I believe. Their, their, their men's dress pants, their golf pants are unreal. That's what I've heard, yeah. Good Comfy. stuff. Well, Dana, this has been such an honor having you on our show. Um, congrats on qualifying for the Tokyo Olympics. Continued good health, and we will definitely be following you next summer in Japan. Thanks sure. for being on the show. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Good, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. After this break, we'll be back with our third and final segment, you're watching Mick and T Sports Report on CHCO TV. Back for the third and final segment of Mick and T Sports Report here on CHCO TV. I'm Joe Tykotsky from New Haven, Connecticut. And I'm Evan McFarland from St. Andrews, New Brunswick, Canada. Those are two, <laughs> those are two great interviews there with uh, with Eric from Flin Flon and Dana. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, Dana was great. Uh, it's cool to get a perspective from a sport that I would never have the ambition to even come close to trying. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's, that's going to be awesome to follow her next summer. For sure. A um, couple quick additional notes from the small town spotlight that we couldn't get on during the interview. Uh, Eric wanted me to mention that the town's got a very active local arts and culture scene. In fact, they're second in all of Canada for the number of free events that they put on yearly concerts, cool. workshops, and things like that. I asked him his favorite restaurant in Flin Flon, and he went with Muggsy's Deli. Sounds uh, delicious. <laughs> just, uh, just edging out the Orange Toad and the always popular Mike's Ice and Burger Hut in the summer. Awesome. Um, and right before the interview started, and when we were chatting, all of a sudden I heard Eric say, ooh, that was an explosion. And then he proceeded to tell me how there are typically a few explosions each week at the local mine. Um, so that was, that was something that I had not prepared for. Um, okay, and now we are going on to one of my favorite, I don't know if it's uh, anyone else's favorite. Um, Doesn't matter. <laughs> is the viewer mail segment. So nice. we have two, two viewer emails this week. And I'll read them. The first one, we got lucky. NBA play-by-play -play broadcaster Marv Albert actually wrote in from New York City. And he said, um, as we mentioned with uh, the interview with the newspaper reporter, he is too old to be in the NBA bubble in Orlando to announce games. So he'll have a, I'll have a lot of free time in, in the next few months, he writes, and thought I can do some side hustle, as the kids like to say. And then he writes, how about if I announced Evan golfing? McFarlane with the putt for par. Oh, he just misses it and now goes to 12 over par after just eight here at the Algonquin. <laughs> oh, man, when was he was here last night? <laughs> <laughs> Good old Marv. Then he also added, I enjoyed sports writer Mike Ganter on your last show and thought during the downtime I can do some play-by-play -play on his writing. Ganter with the unnecessary comma in paragraph three, sentence two. You wouldn't see that at the Globe and Mail. It's another another newspaper up in Canada. Oh, man. For those of you who don't know. Okay. Um, and then Scott from Winnipeg, Scott M. from Winnipeg writes in to say, while talking about the bond spiel on your last episode, the tall gentleman that's a golfer said it's accompanied by alcoholic beverages and some social debauchery. Well, I'd like to set the record straight and let you know that not only are our bond spiels all alcohol free, but we keep the shenanigans to a minimum. And in addition, the local ladies serve up a mean local delicacy tour called a schmoo tort. Have you ever heard of a schmoo tort? I haven't. Okay, well, I am gonna show you exactly through the miracle of modern technology what a schmoo tort is, and then I'll explain it, and then we'll get done with this uh, viewer email till the next episode. Okay, this is a schmoo tort. 
And of course I can't find it on here. I will look one more time and then if not, I will describe it. Um, no, I can't find it, but okay. it's a pecan laced angel food cake filled with sweetened whipped cream and a buttery caramel sauce. That does sound very good. I, I apologize for oh, putting there it is. Ah, there, there it is. There's the schmoo tort. I apologize for putting his bonds fields in the same category as the ones that I've been open to. <laughs> <laughs> but the schmoo tort looks good, even though I think my yeah. insulin pump just exploded looking at that. <laughs> um, but uh, okay, so that's it for the uh, viewer mail episode. And on our last show, if you remember, we debuted a segment called Love the Leaf where Evan helps educate our American viewers on something that's uniquely Canadian. Last uh, time it was the bond spiel, and this time around, Evan, why don't you explain to everyone what a donair is? Oh, nice, a donair. Well, if I got somebody angry explaining a bond spiel, then this is really gonna bother a bunch of people. I, I don't like donairs. There's uh, too much going on in them for me. So what they do is they take a heavily spiced ground beef and they warm it into a log and cook it and then shave slices off, put it in uh, like a type of flatbread, make a sauce out of uh, like canned evaporated milk. And uh, there's, yeah, like that. And there's some tomatoes and onions in there. And uh, people go bananas for those up here. And it's just, it's just got a little bit too much going on for me. Yeah, yeah. So originally, of course, being the, uh stupid american or originally i thought it was a combination of a donut and an eclair and that that's a common common misconception yeah and as comedian jim gaffigan said i'm convinced that the donair was just created so we could digest poutine <laughs> yeah 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 you know you like it i now even pronounce it poutine instead of poutine about a boy we're, we're yeah, getting you all right let's move on to the music spotlight what do you have for this episode uh, yeah, I've been lucky to see this guy a few times. I'm going to keep the uh, the Atlantic Canadian thing alive, but uh, David Miles, he's played a couple shows in St. Andrews here. I've seen him in Fredericton, but he's from Halifax. Uh, definitely check him out if you haven't heard of him. You probably have, but uh, showing some love to that guy. He's got good stuff going on. And his website is davidmiles.com. I'm going to go with a left field pick. The new Taylor Swift album. No, I'm just kidding. Um <laughs> Um, I'm going with a group from Toronto, an all-female group called The Beaches, um, nice. and they're very, very talented. Um, from Toronto, as I mentioned, and their website is thebeachesband.com, so we encourage all you guys to um, check out the music that we've been trying to promote here. All right, now it's on to the shout-out segment as we're coming to the end of uh, yet another episode, and uh, Ab, who do you have for your shout-out this time? I, I can't believe it actually took me this long to do this one, um, but they do tune in on all of our new shows when they come up on TV. But uh, I'm going to give a shout out to both my grandmothers that you've met, actually, Verna yes, and Eplin. So thank you for watching, Grammys. Well, that's it. Believe it or not, for episode nine of Mick and T Sports Report, I'm Joe Tykotsky here in New Haven, Connecticut. And I'm Evan McFarland, still here in St. Andrews, New Brunswick, Canada. We hope you all enjoyed our first season of the show. Thanks to our guest reporter, Eric Westhaver from Flin Flon mm. and Olympian Dana Pitoreski from Vancouver. Yeah. And as always, thanks again to Patrick Watt of CHCO and his crew who helped make our show look a heck of a lot better than it really is. Well, enjoy yeah. the remainder of your summer um, for the kids going back to school. Good luck with that. Stay healthy, stay safe. And we'll see you next month. We're going to have two episodes next month and they're going to be anniversary specials or we have some awesome surprises uh for you guys on that all right take care and this is mick and t sports report on chco tv